God bless you, brothers and sisters. This is Scott Bradley coming to you once again to share with you some things that the Lord has laid upon my heart. I thank God for you that have been corresponding with us, you that have been writing, you that have been leaving your messages via Facebook, being uh, our, our uh, website and other variables where which our voice and this image is being seen and heard. Uh, something is on my heart today that I want to share with you that I believe will be a tremendous blessing. I certainly hope it does uh, because it has to do with comparing. And here of late, I've been comparing the early church, the first century church, the beginning of the church, and the attitude of the church world today, 2,000 years later, here in the 21st century. Jesus made a statement uh, after his resurrection and told the church, told the disciples, ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. This is Acts 1 and 8. And ye shall be witnesses. And I want you to keep that in mind, witnesses. Ye shall be witnesses to me in both Jerusalem and Judea, and Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. Then, of course, after the um, um, after the ascension of the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost, when they were filled with the Holy Ghost, the Bible said that Peter preached, 3,000 souls were baptized, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. That's a tremendous beginning and a tremendous start to the church. And uh, what I oftentimes say is that it was the fire within uh, even on the day of Pentecost, the Bible said there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire. Uh, John the Baptist, when he began to talk about Jesus, who was to come after him, said that I baptize you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And when we talk about the Holy Ghost fire, the fire, matter of fact, there's even a traditional song uh, that we sing. I remember the day and the very hour the Lord filled me with the Holy Ghost power. The fire was burning in my soul, and that's when the Holy Ghost took control. That's a song that we've sang, that I've sang, oh, since the days of my youth coming up in the church. Uh, but I want to deal with the subject today concerning the fire within and the fire underneath. Because would you believe me if I told you that sometime, because of the fire within, we become complacent. We preach, we sing, we minister, we shout, we rejoice because of the fire within. But sometimes God has to put a fire underneath us to move us out of our comfort zone. Now, let's look at the early church. And I want to take a little bit of time to deal with this because you can see a similarity and a parallel in the first church and the church world today. The first church was not fulfilling God's commandment. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Uh, he was not fulfilling the commandment. The church was not fulfilling the commandment. Ye shall be witnesses unto me. Again, I tell you, keep that in mind. Because the church is a witness. Those of us that are saved and love the Lord have been born again are witnesses for the Lord. And they were not fulfilling this purpose because everything was booming in one particular spot. Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Now, let's look at this again. Let's examine this. And let's see if we can see a parallel between that church and this 21st century church. First of all, Peter preached and 3,000 folks got baptized. Can you imagine starting a church with 3,000 people? Uh, those of us that have ever pastored or are pastoring uh, probably haven't had 3,000 people uh, enter our door going and coming. We've never had 3,000 members combined all together. Or oh, there's some that have. There's some, some, some mega churches and, and mega ministries that have over 3,000, 5 and 10,000 members. I understand that. But the great majority of churches average uh, about 60 members, 50, 60 members at the church. Uh, so so stop, stop and think. What you had here in Jerusalem was a mega church, uh, what we refer to today as a mega church, 3,000 people to start out. But then the Bible says the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. So not only did you start out with 3,000 members, but your church continued to increase. It continued to grow. But then the Bible says this, that the people sold all their possessions brought the money, and laid it at the apostles' feet. So not only did you have a large mega church, but you also had a rich church. Now, stop and think if half the people that did that. Stop and think even in your congregation, uh, Reverend uh, Pastor, if uh, half your people paid their tithes, how, how, how happy you would be because of the finance that, you, that would come in that you'd be able to accomplish and do things with. But this early church had people bringing the money, sold their possessions, making pledges, paying tithes, offerings, bringing the money and laying it at the apostles' feet. Now, again, let's examine this first century church. Large, mega church, finances coming in. But then the Lord was working miracles. 
The Lord was working miracles. The Lord had uh, 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 healed the sick, uh, cast out devils, raised the dead, in fact. Uh, in fact, Peter, after his preaching was put in jail, the angel of the Lord came and gave him a personal escort out of the jail. All types of miraculous things were happening. The, 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 the lame man at the gate of beautiful was, was healed. When Peter and John said, look on us, silver and gold have we none, but such as we have we give unto thee. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. And a man who had never walked in his life was now leaping for joy because of the miraculous power of God that was operating. So look at what was happening. Membership increasing, finance coming in, miracles taking place. And you know what happened? The early church became complacent because everything was happening in Jerusalem. Everything was booming in Jerusalem. Jerusalem was the, the Holy Ghost headquarters. Jerusalem was where the power of God was moving. And consequently, they were not fulfilling Acts 1 and 8. They were not going into all the world. They were, they were booming in Jerusalem. They were complacent in Jerusalem. Now, I'm saying that to say this, that I'm looking at the 21st century church today, brothers and sisters, and we can see an infiltration of other religions, other influences, even in this country of America. And it's simply because the church has become satisfied staying in the church. We have not gone out. We don't have outreach. Uh, we, 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 we're afraid of challenges. We, we back down. We compromise because we don't want to spoil a good thing. And I'm not knocking mega churches. I'm not saying it's a negative reflection to mega churches. At least that's not my intention. However, I think it's interesting to note that when you look at the mega church, a lot of times, the reality is it's impossible, first of all, for one man, and I have nobody in mind when I say this, but it's impossible for one man to pastor that many people. If you've got over a thousand members, uh, I doubt very seriously if you even know all of your members. And again, I'm not saying this in a negative sense. I'm simply showing you a little logic here and giving you a comparison to the early church. The early church uh, had thousands of people that were coming. The early church had, had thousands. And in spite of persecution, in spite of, 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 of what was coming against them, the church continued to strive, uh, thrive, and continue to grow. And I've known that happen. Sometimes persecution causes a church to grow. I've known it to happen in foreign countries. I remember the testimony of a young man uh, from Uganda during the time of the late dictator Idi Amin, who was bringing persecution against the church. And he said, regardless, the church and the gospel continue to spread like wildfire. But I'm saying that to say this, the early church had become complacent because everything was happening in Jerusalem. Everything was booming in Jerusalem. The power was in Jerusalem. The people were being healed and delivered in Jerusalem. Money was coming into Jerusalem. The church was growing in Jerusalem. But God realized that as long as they stayed complacent in Jerusalem, they would not fulfill, ye shall be witnesses unto me in both Jerusalem and Judea. They hadn't even penetrated to, to Judea yet. And Samaria, and of course Samaria was 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 uh, a, a a breakthrough ground for them because of the racial divide. You know, you look at the racism that happened particularly in America today, and the things that we're suffering as a result of racial attitudes. That's not a new thing. There was racial divide even in the early church between the Samaritans and the Jews, and it has to do with ancestry. Time won't permit me to go into it. Uh, what Jews felt that they were half breeds and all that kind of thing. Same thing that happens today, but. The Lord told them, you're going to be witnesses also in Samaria. So what did the Lord do? I oftentimes say that Acts 1 and 8 was not starting to fulfill until Acts 8 and 1. What took place in Acts 8 and 1? Well, the latter portion of that first verse of the 8th chapter says, And there was great persecution against the church, and the people began to scatter. Sometimes God has got to allow something to happen. Or as I like to say, a fire underneath us. Now, the fire underneath us is not a comfort fire. I know the fire within, the Holy Ghost fire, that makes us feel good, makes us feel happy, makes us feel inspired, makes us shout and ready to do what God says. But sometimes God has to put a fire underneath us. And the fire underneath us is not designed to make us shout and feel good. It's to make us uncomfortable. It's to make us move. It's to make us move from complacency and comfort. It's to drive us out of where we are and take us to another place. And so the Lord allowed persecution to come. And when persecution came, the Bible said they were scattered. Now, isn't it interesting that God had to use what the devil meant for evil, God meant for good, what the devil desired to destroy the church, God and his wisdom. And that's why I thank God for God being God and the wisdom of God. God can take anything that the devil does and turn it to his glory. Just like you ought to look at your life. Things that the devil has done to destroy you. God is wise enough to take your mistakes and failures and turn it to a positive for his glory. Praise the Lord. I just want to take time to thank God and give God praise for that. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. But getting back to the original point, 
The Lord allowed persecution. The devil scattered the church, just knew he had destroyed the church, destroyed what was happening. But yet because of the fire within, I remember the fire underneath them, the persecution, which was the fire, scattered them. But the fire within them caused them everywhere they go to preach the gospel. And now the gospel was starting to spread throughout the world. And would you know, Philip, who was one of the first deacons of the church, and the Bible said that the deacons were chosen because they were men full of the Holy Ghost. Philip, the evangelizing deacon, winds up in Samaria. Now, isn't it interesting? He never would have booked a revival in Samaria. He never would have, would have considered to come to Samaria because, again, of the racial divide. And yet, he running for his life, when he looked up, there he was in Samaria. And there, the Bible said he preached Christ. He didn't preach racism. He didn't preach denomination. He didn't preach philosophy. He preached Christ. And brothers and sisters, I'm convinced that this is the message to the world, Christ. It's not in religion. It's not in philosophy. It's not in this, that, or the other. It's Christ, because Christ is the only answer to the world. Christ is the only salvation of mankind. There's no other name given unto heaven whereby we must be saved other than the name of Jesus Christ. And there Philip preached Christ. Now, getting back to my original point, God had to put a fire underneath. And that's why, you know, sometimes I, I, I see things that happen in mega churches. And again, I don't say this, at least it's not my intention to knock in the mega churches. But, you know, the, the larger your, your, your church, the more you, you encounter. I mean, that's just with anything. Uh, Jesus had 12 disciples and one of them was a devil. Now, if you have Jesus had 12 disciples and one of them was the devil. And if the devil was in heaven and got kicked out of heaven, don't you know the devil's coming to church? And, and the more people you get, the more... Uh, chances are, if I can use the term, odds are you're going to get more devils.